management's talking about innovation again. Whereas if you get that even one step in, people are like, oh, we actually mean it and we can do it. And it starts to kind of build this momentum. Yeah. So when is the point that these like two, three people are trying to get it spread it out to the whole company or parts of the company because they have a plan, they want to elaborate something or whatever. How do they do it with other people within the organization and get them enthusiastic and interested and engaged in that? Yeah, it's, um, it's building a movement. There's this great uh, TED video of how to build a movement. And um, if you haven't seen it, it's you know, at this kind of outdoor festival concert and everyone's sitting on the lawn watching. And there's one guy who's just dancing. Like yeah, crazy. I know this video. Yeah. And, and everyone's kind of like, what is going on there? And the crazy person dancing, the lone nut, as they call it in the video, that's the innovation lone nut. team. <laughs> the lone nut. That's the innovation <laughs> team. And but then, you know, you get a second person who comes. And that's the follower. And the follower, as they say in the video, legitimizes the lone nut. And so the innovation team and especially their sponsor, uh, the executive kind of overseeing it, they need to find those, that, that second guy, you know, the follower. Yeah. And there are people in every organization who, who want to innovate. They've been asking questions. They see the opportunity for something new. They just need an outlet for it. And so it's almost like if you're out there as the lone nut dancing away, they'll find you. And then you'll get the third person and that's when the movement starts. But it's, it's slow and you have to be willing to look a little crazy for a little while. Yeah. So let's say that you did that and you have these followers and you have lots of ideas and some of them would be pitching their idea. So what are the mistakes they should avoid if they pitch this innovative idea to, know, to management, to the C-level, I don't know who is like listening, but what do they need to do in order to make it successful for them? Yeah. Oh, pitching an idea. I see so many people, especially in large companies, they get really excited about their ideas. And so they, they rush into the executive's office and it's like, we should do this. And okay, like what's next and why should we do it? And why do you think we should do it? And there's all these questions that come up that in, in the enthusiasm of the person with the idea, they just want to share their idea. And unfortunately, what happens is that becomes a really nice conversation, but then nothing happens. And so it's, you know, as I say, I, ideas are a dime a dozen, but, you know, it's really about action and decisions. And so if you have a great idea that you want to pitch, put yourself in the shoes of the person listening. And, you know, yes, you have a great idea. Why is it a great idea? How does it align with the the priorities and the strategies of the organization what is needed to move forward not your grand vision we're not going to go again we're not going to put on tennis shoes and go run a marathon you know what's the next step and what do you need in order to do that and kind of thinking in these baby steps and laying out the path um, so that so that the person you're pitching to it feels reasonable, it feels responsible because it aligns with their goals and it feels practical and doable without taking a huge risk. Because if you go into you know, your boss's office and your executive's office, like I have an idea, I need $10 million. You're never gonna get no. that. Yeah. You know, I, I thought that you would say that these like innovation leaders who are the ones who are responsible to mitigate between what is the strategy, what is needed, where is the company going and what you could do about it. And then like do this match. And then you have someone like explaining that to leadership, I guess. So what you're saying is like, they could just do it if yeah. the, if the executive is, is open for it, right. They yep. could just do it. Yeah. And, exactly. And present their idea. I, I, when I think about pitching, I usually work with lots of startups here in Israel. And pitching in the usual world, in the in the VC world, is like you're pitching to someone who is like a fund, like a, a venture capital, mm -hmm. for example. And it's I guess it's a, it's a bit or a lot different when you're doing it within your company. First, you know people; they know you, and you're risking something that might sound stupid. 
and more than that, like you're, you, you want more than the money and the funding. You want them to trust you and you, you, maybe you've proven that you should be trusted. So the relationship here between the listener and the pitcher are so different, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's so different. And it's funny. It's in, um, you know, and, and I've heard this from friends who've gone through VC pitches is that really what you want is a yes or a no. The kind of like the maybe, the send me more information, the, you know, check back in three months. It, it's kind of this terrible middle ground. And like you were saying, in, in a company, there's a relationship there. But more often than not, that leads to that horrible middle ground. Like, oh, okay, well, well what about this? And maybe come back with more information. Because the executive that you're pitching to likes you and trusts you and doesn't want to be mean and doesn't want to crush your idea or crush your enthusiasm. So you end up in kind of this perpetual cycle of just more questions and not really making progress. So that's why it's so important to go in and say, like, look, I have a plan and have an ask like entrepreneurs do. Like, I want you to, you know, I want this kind of funding and I'm going to do this with it. And it's. Again, it's a totally different conversation because, you know, we're not talking about ownership of the idea and stake, but you still got to go in with a plan and with an ask. Otherwise, it's just going to be endless questions. And do you feel that most of the employees are really educated in order to do that? You know, like an entrepreneur, he has no other way because this is what he decided to do. So he needs to learn how to get funding. But I guess that if you're an ex a manager in this specific uh, domain, you're usually not pitching and you're usually not thinking about the business plan if you're not in the business section of the company and so forth. And yeah. maybe you're from, I don't know, from science part or whatever, from, from yeah. development, whatever. So, so how do you teach them Uh, to be more entrepreneurial in a sense, just to create an idea and to go forth with it. Yeah. And, and so much of it is, like you said, entrepreneurs, they, <clears throat> they have no other choice. You have to figure this out. And there are resources out there, but like that pressure of like, I've got to figure it out now is real. And in a company, you don't have that pressure because you collect a paycheck, whether somebody likes your idea or not. And yeah. So that's why so often I'll see people who have great ideas and then they've shared them and nothing's come of it and they get really demotivated and they get disengaged. And then you get into all of the stuff that you hear about, you know, the great resignation as it's being talked about in the U.S. of everybody leaving their jobs and finding new ones. And, you know, it's because I think there is a mindset of, well, I'm an employee, so I can share an idea. But if someone doesn't like it, fine, I'll just go back to my job. Versus taking on that entrepreneurial mindset and saying, you know what, I'm a business owner. And, you know, whether I define the business as me and my career, or I feel ownership for the business I'm working on, like, I have to have that same drive and that same scrappiness and that, you know, same figure it outedness, not a word, um, that an entrepreneur does and hold myself to that standard. And again, some people... Like they have that inner drive. And so it's a matter of, you know, kind of giving them permission to live it yeah. and to, to unlock it. And other folks are going to say, well, that's great. But I also just kind of like my job and I like doing my job. And, and that's great too, because goodness knows you need people to operate the company. If everybody wanted to change it. Yeah. You know, we can't all want to do the same thing, but giving permission and clearing the way for people who have that drive is so, so important. Yeah. I know like when I started with innovation after so many years in the tech industry in Israel, I didn't understand really the gap of we don't have like 100 years company in Israel because we're so much younger, but in general, just to understand that even if you're very innovative and very creative and you have, you know, the grit, you know, to do so, When you're in a certain position and you don't want to risk it in any way, mm -hmm. you, you, maybe this huge company has the great talents and lots of money and they want to invest, but still they're lacking this, I don't know, mindset of people just going through that. And even if they get to know again and again and again, and they will get no in the beginning for sure, mm -hmm. they still stick to the plan to do something. 
<laughs> yes. So yeah, no, this it, is. It, it reminds me. Early, so I started my career, I was in Procter and Gamble in brand management. And, you know, I'm coming out of university, I'm in my young 20s, and like just all, you know, fight and motivation and all of that. And I was incredibly lucky that I was put on an innovation team when I joined PG. And, you know, PG hadn't really launched a new brand in, in decades at that point. So we were, we were very entrepreneurial within P&G of figuring everything out. And, you know, so I didn't have all of this background and this experience or a mortgage or a family or all <laughs> any of these realities of life. And so I remember just going and kind of like bowl in a China shop. What do we need to get done? Let's get it done. Don't worry about process. And I had a great time and broke a few things along the way. But at that time, I just, I couldn't understand some of my other colleagues who were like, oh, well, no, you know, you have to follow this process. I'm like, yeah, that'll take too long. We got to do this. And now that I am older and not in my 20s anymore, I, I can so empathize with those colleagues that I had. Like, oh, like I know how experience can kind of say, no, 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 you know, play it a little safe. Just, you know, follow the process. What's the difference between taking four weeks versus two weeks? And how over time kind of that that fire that drives you can get a little bit dimmed. And so how important it is for people to hold on to that fire and hold on to that kind of ownership mentality and that drive because everything will conspire to kind of dull it and, and you can't let that happen. Yeah. You know, um, when you're talking about this fire, I feel like this is more than just, you know, creating a new thing in your company. It's like in general, you see people uh, getting comfortable and, you know, like going to work, coming back, seeing Netflix more or less. And, and it seems that this is needed for you in your life uh, in order to create change. Not only, you know, in your company, you know, to create something which is unusual or not in the same process as before, maybe people will not agree with you. I think it's important for you as a person in your life. Sometimes you need to do a certain, like different direction in your life or to do things differently or to go and seek what, what is creating this fire within you. And if you don't have that, and I think that when you're working many years in a certain, like very kind of stable and comforting place. You lose that in a sense. So you see that these young people, other than that they are young, there are lots of like moving all the time, changing all the time. It's like, and, and they don't get scared that they don't have the pension and all the benefits. Like, yeah, like moving more in their life, sometimes some will say too much, <laughs> is, <laughs> is really important in order to create something new and to grow as a person and as a business. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think it's so, you know, I, I always go back to, you know, when people talk about innovation, they, they think about things, but ultimately like it's about solving a problem. And I think that's where the, the fire comes from is when you see a problem that needs to be solved or um, you're like, how is this still a problem? How hasn't this been fixed? You know, that just kind of, that lights that fire, that kind of like, no, we need to fix this. We can do better. And yeah. you know, for so many people, that can be in such an amazing internal motivation. And yeah. you know, some problems, yeah, you on your own can fix. Most problems, I mean, you know, you need a team or you need a movement. Um, but it, you know, I always think that if if you focus on the problem and solving that and making things better, that's just that will drive you, that will push you through the nose. And, you know, you'll stop seeing nose as the end of a conversation and the start of a conversation. Yeah. And so that, that problem focus is, is so critical to keeping that fire going. Yeah. You know, like for me through the years, I got many like options to go to a big company and then, you know, proposal and, and so, and, and I knew it's not for me, but only like in the last few years, I understood that it's because I don't want to lose this fire. I just, I just want to learn all the time and learn new things and go to new projects and new things. And for me, it's really essential in what I, how I describe myself. 
And I guess that not everyone sees that. I'm, many people say, okay, it's like I'm, I'm really comfortable in here. I'm, I'm, I'm best at doing this perfectly. So yeah. this is what I want to do, right? But in a company, as you said, you need to have both. Although I think that sometimes when people are too innovative, they are like rebels and people don't really like them that, that, that much. They're doing too much noise and want to change what they're like move, move the ground, which is like not moving right now. Yeah. Um, and you need to, to be willing to be, um, I know, less appreciated, less liked. I don't know if that's yeah. the right. Yeah, no, I mean, change is uncomfortable for, yeah. for everybody. It's just different degrees of discomfort. And so, you know, when you have a really strong innovator, a really strong entrepreneur within a big company, they, they are going to, to bristle at the constraints and they are going to push really hard for change. And like you said, it's going to make people uncomfortable. And, and then, you know, I, I always counsel folks, okay, it comes down to a decision. If you can say, you know what, I'm going to go in and I'm going to push as hard as I can until I can't push anymore. And then I'm going to, you know, find a new space. I'm going to, you know, become an entrepreneur again or an entrepreneur again. Or you can say, you know what, I'm going to push. And then when I realize I'm not making any progress, I'm going to change my tactics and, you know, maybe soften a little bit, maybe tone it down, but still like still stay there and keep pushing because someone needs to push. And both avenues are completely legitimate and, and effective. You just need to be aware of, okay, what am I trying to do? And, right. you know, what's right for the company. Sometimes you need someone to go in and just you know, kind of question everything and, and try to tear it all down and rebuild it because that's the only way it'll change. Other times you need someone who's willing to kind of just keep nudging, nudging, nudging. Yeah. So you just told us about working in Procter and Gamble. Mm -hmm. And I know that you work in Boston Consulting Group and yep. in a place called Innocide. So what did yeah. you learn from working in these like different environments about innovation and what you're doing right now? Oh, yeah. So P&G was a great training ground. Like I said, it was my first job out of university and, you know, the kind of the freedom, quite honestly, that my teammates and I had to do what needed to be done, regardless of what the rules said, just um, really showed me what was possible within a big company in a lot of ways. I say, you know, it's my first job out of university. I thought it was normal. Now, I'm like, oh my gosh, that is so unique. But I know it's possible. I know it is possible to do something dramatically different within a big company and to break the rules and, you know, and make something happen. You know, BCG, Boston Consulting Group, where I worked both in Boston and in Copenhagen, was an incredible experience in terms of learning how to think very strategically, you know, how to kind of take, how to see the business and all of its parts and all of the demand, understand all of the demands that executives have to, have to juggle and have to deal with. And then at Innocite, which was the firm, innovation firm founded by Clay Christensen, that's really where, you know, I got to go deep into really how to take so much of what I learned and found important in P&G in terms of the consumer as boss you know, solve problems, you know, think creatively and marry that with what I learned at BCG in terms of the bigger picture that executives have to deal with and, you know, how to do that, how to see that happen at, you know, clients I've worked with like Nike, like Medtronic, um, you know, other huge, I'll hold USA, you know, really big companies doing really big, amazing things. And then now at mile zero, it's kind of, all continues to build on each other because what I, I really focus on is taking that, that perspective of innovation and kind of strategy and leadership and understanding the business and then get really, really practical about it and mm -hmm. say, okay, the theory is a great place to start, but that's not where we end. How do we use this to build something that is going to work for you know your company and your situation, you know on down to the specific words. So like another example, mm -hmm. when I was working with a big sporting goods company, I said the word process, and I think 
they all had a reaction. I think somebody may have broken out in hives. Like it was just processed, just in, like had such a strong reaction to. And as we kept talking, like we can't use the word process, even though that's essentially what we're doing is we're, you know, do this step first, the step second, you know, it's iterative. And so we're like, okay, let's not use the word process. And eventually we're like, let's call it a playbook. But that word process, if we had continued to use it, would have just killed everything we were trying to do. So that mm -hmm. I, that idea of get, like, let's just get practical for what's going to work here is really the focus of the work I do now. And for you as a professional to work in this huge company and this big consultancy and now have your own. So what is the change that is demanded from you in order to do this, like, you know, uh, switch? It is... Um, Nothing that would be a surprise to you. It it's going from you know, you have all of these resources, and it's you know, it's a phone call. Your computer doesn't work. You just call IT. Um, <laughs> all of that yeah. stuff. You know, you just turn in your expense report, and things happen. And when you have your own business, when you're an entrepreneur, all of that is you. And it's again, no surprise. It is incredible incredibly fun. It is incredibly hard. It is solving problems every single day. It is getting really comfortable with being wrong and like running experiments and be like, well, that didn't work. I'll try <laughs> something different. And, yeah. you know, it's a very different feeling, um, but it's, it's exciting. It's exciting yeah. to kind of be the entrepreneur as well. So you feel that right now in your life, this gives you more like meaning when you're doing it, like doing, doing what you're supposed to do within a company with all the restrictions and all the limitations. Now it's like, yeah, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Sometimes more yeah. successfully, sometimes, sometimes not, but. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it all depends on how you define success, right? You know, if, right. if success were, oh, you know, I have this title and this page. I mean, when you have your own company, you can give yourself any title you want. Um, yeah. But it started to redefine success for me. And re I realized how important learning is. Like, I just need to constantly be learning and creating and trying things out. And when you're at a company for a long period of time, you know, the learning starts to fade and you kind of stop trying things out because you get comfortable even, you know, you don't even realize it's happening and it's still right. happening. Right. Um, so it is, yes, it, it is feels happening. very much like, you know, energizing every single day and, you know, starting the day to be like, oh, I have a plan and literally none of this will happen today, but I can't wait to see what happens. Right. You know, like this feeling of creating your own path or finding your, your own path and then creating upon it uh, is something that I think is really so for me as a person is so important. And also, although it's like sometimes challenging, you know, because it's not like I have this title, this is the role, everybody's requiring for me this deliverable. So like working in a group, you need to have this specific, like, this is what I'm doing. This is exactly what I'm doing. But when you're, when you're a business owner, you can do whatever you want, right? So you can take more, more projects, less projects and, and learn new things or something which is less important for you. So it's like very trying to control whatever you can control in your life, right? Yeah. But, but it's like, it seems that what is so hard for a big company with so many resources, they have smart people, they have the connections, they have the money, they have like so many resources. And the opposite of it is like your total freedom as, as a person to be an entrepreneur, to create something, a company, an agency or self, like whatever you're trying is you don't have as much resources, right? You don't have all the connections and, and the salespeople and the, and the clients, whatever. But still, you're so much more capable in many, in many senses in order to, to really deliver something, which yeah. is, it, it's, a, it's so strange. You know, when, when I always think about companies, I'm saying like, why? <laughs> it's like the way that they are structured is like, uh, not enable, enabling or decreasing the capability of creating something new action. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it puts everyone, you know, in this box and stay in this box. And, and the funny thing is, is that, you know, like you said, there's so many resources that a big company has, but it leads them to 
do crazy things, which is they either hoard the resources, you're like, oh, no, 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 like something's going to happen. The market's going to tank, like something bad will happen. So I have to hoard it. Or they're like, we have so many resources and they just throw them at everything. And yeah. that's when you get crazy ideas being funded or like multi-million dollar offsites when we could travel. And you're just like, wait a minute, there's a, there's a middle ground here where you're spending, you're investing and you're doing that smartly in growing the business. It's not hoard all the money or spend all the money. So. Yeah. So I, I read in your site that people, even your customer and your boss, decide with their hearts and justify with their heads, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. tell me, give me an example. What do you mean when you say that? Yeah, the, the most striking example I can give you, this is uh, several years ago when I was working with a client who is um, in the medical device space and we were looking at creating a surgical robot. And you know, there's a surgical robot out there many now, but at the time there was one big dominant one. And so we were taught and the insanely, like incredibly expensive. And I remember talking to the CFO of a hospital system, kind of a small regional hospital system in the US, not a big one, like, you know, the Cleveland Clinic or the Mayo Clinic, you know, small regional one. And, you know, I was asking about, okay, you know, what's the break even? How many surgeries do you need to do on your robot in order for it to pay out? And he was giving me good answers. And then he said, well, we're getting a second one. It's like, wait a minute, you're getting a, a second one. That's another huge investment. And he's like, let me go back to your break even. And, and I'm making up numbers. And I said, okay, well, you said you need to do 400 surgeries a year on this robot to break even, but you're only doing 200. But you're buying a second robot. and I mean, I majored in marketing and minored in English literature. Math is not my thing. But even I can be like, if you need 400 and you only have 200, why are you buying another? And so here's the CFO making this decision that makes no sense. And he said, well, I was really popular after I approved getting the last one. <laughs> and it was nice to not be Mr. No anymore. And so when they asked me for a second one, I figured it would work itself out. Wow. <laughs> and it reminds and so, me of, of Dan Ariely. You know, Dan Ariely is talking about, yes. uh, you know, behavioral economics. And... <laughs> yes, it is totally that of, you know, we decide with our hearts. It's going to, what are, how do I want to feel? What are my motivations? Um, what do I want to accomplish? Kind of all of these, these qualitative, these feelings, these intangible things. And then we justify the decision we've made with our heads. So what is the data I need to justify my decision, all that. So, and then the third part of that is it takes guts to act. Because I think we've all sat in meetings where you, know, you, you think you've made a decision and then nothing happens after the meeting. And that's the guts part. Because it actually, you know, especially if you're doing something different, if you're you know, investing in innovation, you know, that, like I said, it takes courage. And so you yeah. need the guts to actually put that decision into action. Of course. Okay. So it's like my last question before we finish. So what is your number one tip for entrepreneurs? Mm, my number one tip for entrepreneurs is fall in love with the problem and not your idea. Because the mm -hmm. problem... I don't want to say the problem will always be there, but the idea is going to have to shift. So if you love the problem, that will keep the fire inside you as you go through the process of, of creating and selling that solution. Right. Okay. I want to thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to ask you, where could people hear more about you, where I can contact you and so forth? Sure. So you can find me on LinkedIn. It's Robin M. Bolton. Or go to my website, mile zero. So it's M I L E Z E R O dot I O. I O. Wow. So I want to thank you, Rowan, for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you as always. It's like our second talk, and I'm sure we're going to have more of it. Always Definitely. nice to talk to you. Great to thank talk you. with you. Thank you. This is so much fun. <laughs> sure. And to all of you change makers out there, thank you for joining us. 
And if you want to learn more about what I do, go to invincibleinnovation.com. You're so invited to visit. And I'll see you next week with another innovative, insightful talk. See ya.